Hi, I'm Dr. David Rubin. I'm a professor of medicine and co-director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at the University of Chicago. Joining me is Professor William Sanborn, who is chief of GI at the University of California in San Diego. Today we're going to be discussing investigator insights, clinical trial endpoints, and clinical trial indices and disease indices in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm looking forward to this discussion and hearing what uh, Professor Sanborn has to say. Hi, Bill. Hi. So we're going to talk a little bit about things that have changed both in clinical trial design and by extension in clinical practice. So why don't we start by just reviewing what the traditional clinical endpoints have been for the practicing clinician, the people taking care of patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. What uh, have been the traditional endpoints and how have people managed these patients? Well, I think in Crohn's disease, really, you, you see the patient in the clinic, you take a history and ask about abdominal pain and stool frequency, and if patients are taking steroids, you want to know about that. And the treatment goals were to get patients' uh, symptoms resolved, so to treat their abdominal pain, their diarrhea, and uh, to get them off steroids. And for ulcerative colitis, almost the same. Stool frequency, rectal bleeding more than pain, yep. urgency, and, and uh, then again to eliminate steroid use. In, in the traditional approach, there hadn't been very much um, understanding or, or forethought for what was going to happen next year. It was really about getting through what the patient's experiencing now. Um, when a patient was given medical therapies historically in Crohn's and UC, how had the clinician tried to address their symptoms and what were their primary goals? Well, I'm going to date myself. You know, I started GI training in 1990, finished in 1993, and back in those Stone Age uh, days, we had sulfasalazine. I think olsalazine or dipentum had recently been approved, and we had prednisone, and I guess we had mesalamine enemas. In most of the country, the immune suppressive drugs weren't being used. And so neither sulfasalazine uh, nor uh, steroids for long-term uh, therapy had any maintenance benefit. And so in, there was generations of gastroenterologists who were treated when there were no effective maintenance drugs for Crohn's disease. And I think that led to this concept of putting the fire out, waiting to see what happened, and eventually patients would show up with complications that required surgery. That's right. And uh, of course, long-term steroid use was common in the absence of other therapies. Uh, I even saw that in my training, which is a little bit beyond yours, but um, I started my training as a fellow in 1997, so not too far distant. Uh, and I remember rounding and we had no um, really approved therapies. We had no long-term trials for Crohn's disease that really gave us any guidance. And it would be one patient after another on sulfasalazine or on prednisone or waiting for their next surgery. Uh, and a lot of patients with TPN and a variety of other outcomes that uh, had resulted from their disease. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, how have things changed over time? And what was the actual progression of our improvements? Did the therapy come first? or did our attempt to change the endpoints come first, or were these two things married? Well, I think several things um, happened. Uh, first of all, there was really the early work with 6 mercaptopurine occurred at the Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, published about 1980, but the data were conflicting as to whether azathioprine and mercaptopurine were effective, and it was really the early 1990s before they came into more widespread use. And then about 1995, uh, methotrexate was demonstrated to be effective for Crohn's disease. And then uh, the pivotal study of infliximab uh, was published in New England in 1997, and infliximab was approved for Crohn's disease in 1998. And it was the sequence, I think, of those three uh, classes of drugs, the azathioprine, mercaptopurine, methotrexate, and then biologic therapy with infliximab, that allowed people to uh, raise their expectations for therapy. And one of the interesting things that really came out of some of the early treated patients with infliximab was you could close fistulas or reduce fistula drainage, and, and then that led to an indication for that. The other um, historical note, there was some interest in whether you should treat to colonoscopy endpoints back in the 1980s, and the French uh, study group Chetade actually developed an instrument that I think we'll talk more about today, the Crohn's Disease Endoscopic Index of Severity, or CDEIS. But what they had in the 80s for therapy was just what I spoke of, prednisone. So they gave patients with, uh, who were undergoing uh, therapy with prednisone uh, colonoscopy and then looked to see if it healed, and they didn't see much healing 
So they concluded that colonoscopy was of no value in Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of left it there because we didn't have any other drug to try for about a decade. And, and I think we'll come back to that. But the, that was one of the reasons we didn't do more in Crohn's disease. Sigmoidoscopy and, and rigid proctoscopy was always part of the ulcerative colitis assessment. Yes. Uh, so what, if you had to summarize, what were some of the limitations of these traditional endpoints? I mean, what drove the field forward? Other than not having a therapy approved for Crohn's disease uh, by the FDA, uh, what were the other limitations to using some of these endpoints, either in clinical trial or, frankly, in clinical practice? What were the drawbacks? Well, I think, you know, several things happened. We started doing epidemiology studies, and you could look at the decades of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and by about 2000, you could see that nothing had changed for 40 years in surgical rates. So that told us that the putting the fire out with intermittent symptomatic therapy wasn't going to cut it. Yeah. Then we had the concept of starting to use effective maintenance therapy. So again, azathioprine, um, mercaptopurine, methotrexate, and then infliximab. And infliximab ended up being approved as maintenance therapy about 2002, I think. So we, we finally had something you could imagine doing. Someone went back, uh, Geert de Haans, and revisited the idea of whether you could get bowel healing with infliximab, and you could actually as compared to prednisone. And so that raised the possibility that treating the bowel healing uh, might be a better endpoint. And then with infliximab, you could start to see reductions in the clinical trials in hospitalization and surgery rates. And eventually you could start to see that in some uh, epidemiology settings. And so all of that raised the possibility that you might be able to um, raise your sights on endpoints for, for other things that would be more meaningful to patients. Um, so I think those were all kind of important changes. And then people began to think about whether um, there were analogies between Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. So in rheumatoid arthritis, the concept is not for all patients, but for many patients that it's a chronic destructive progressive disease where you get progressive uh, joint damage that eventually leads to physical disability of the joints. So, you know, some year, years ago, but not very many years ago, we began to think about whether that was also true for Crohn's disease. And so people started looking at the progression from inflammatory disease to complications. So when you and I trained, the idea was that there were these different phenotypes of Crohn's disease. There was stricturing disease and fistulizing disease and uh, inflammatory or non-structuring, uh, non-penetrating Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And then what we saw in the epidemiology studies was that there really aren't phenotypes, that those things are complications, and most patients start without them, and if you watch them long enough, most people get them. That's right. Uh, so what about ulcerative colitis? How have things matured through the ulcerative colitis field? Well. I in some ways, it was easier to begin with, and now it's uh, getting a little bit more uh, interesting and complicated. So I, I think we, I always thought that ulcerative colitis was completely reversible. So you could have terrible lesions, uh, but if you got them healed, you could restore your physiology. But of course, we really, thinking back on it, we recognized from 20 or 30 years ago these patients that had lead pipe colons where mm -hmm. there were a few drugs and they'd get a barium enema because we didn't have uh, colonoscopes and you'd lose the haustral folds and the function. So I think we're almost coming back to that these days. We're treating patients not only to that diarrhea, rectal bleeding, and uh, urgency endpoint, but seeing if the bowel is healed up at endoscopy. And then you can see these patients who have a disconnect where they've got diarrhea without right. rectal bleeding, their bowel's healed, and they've probably got some irreversible bowel damage as well. And so at, there's probably a subset of patients with ulcerative colitis who also have a progressive disease if you don't get them treated, and then they lose function and have some degree of disability. Right. So if we talk about the clinical trial indices, uh, and let's start with Crohn's again. Um, you mentioned that once we had a therapy that could close or heal fistulas, we knew that we could study it more and we could get an approved indication for it. But tell me a little bit about the history of the Crohn's Disease Activity Index, for instance. We've been married to the CDAI for a very long time, and we've all recognized there's some limitations to it. So how did this come to be, and where is it going? Well, it's, a, it's a sort of interesting historically. The uh, National Institutes of Health, NIH, 
funded a study in the 1970s called the uh, National uh, Crohn's Disease Cooperative Study. And the, this was actually a very visionary study at the time, and the physicians who ran it realized that they had no way to measure Crohn's disease. So they set out with, to have a complicated but robust process to create an instrument for measuring Crohn's disease. And they, so what they did was they interviewed a series of experienced clinicians, asked them uh, what they thought uh, was important, and then they would have a global assessment of the patient and they would regress this kind of list of the things they came up with. And they came up with eight items. Now, uh, the big three drivers of it are abdominal pain, stool frequency, and ask the patient how they feel, or patient well-being. Okay. Actually, body weight and hematocrit didn't make the statistical cut, but the people that were making the index just thought it was obvious that they were so important that they forced those things in anyway. Okay. And so we ended up with this eight component weighted index, the CDAI, which has been the backbone of drug development for, you know, since the uh, 70s. What's happened very recently is the FDA has uh, come around to thinking that you really want to hear from patients, so patient reported outcomes, and they want these patient reported outcomes to be derived from patients and not healthcare professionals. And so the CDAI is actually not a patient reported outcome or PRO measure because it was generated by experienced clinicians, not patients. So I think we're going to see an evolution away from the CDAI at the request of the FDA and other regulatory authorities. Um, my hunch is that some of the, what I will call items reported by patients as mm. opposed to an official patient reported outcome, right. like abdominal pain and diarrhea will ultimately be an important part of the with the PRO that we will get to, but that's gonna change, I think, over time. So it makes you wonder, though, because some of the limitations to the CDAI include the fact that patients who are having diarrhea or abdominal pain can be mistaken for people who have true active inflammation. And um, moving towards patient-reported outcomes that might include similar uh, endpoints uh, sounds like we may be back where we started when we end up looking at all these things. Do you think that's I, true? I do think that's true. I think I think that whatever PRO that we get to won't actually be better than the CDI. You'll feel better about it because it will have been properly derived, yeah. but it's probably not going to operate better. If you are treating a patient with psoriasis, you you know asking the patient how they feel or what their symptoms are is a secondary thing. You directly examine the disease. Right. So one way of thinking about this is, for sure, in ulcerative colitis and increasingly in Crohn's disease, you can directly examine the disease. And so the you know a point of evolving discussion, I think, is going to be whether the primary outcome measure for a clinical trial should be a direct endoscopic measurement of the disease, a patient-reported outcome, a composite of the two, and as you say, especially in Crohn's disease, where you can have so many other causes of symptoms, right. maybe you limit the use of the PRO to patients where you've objectively identified that they have active inflammation as a likely cause of uh, their symptoms before you apply the PRO, and maybe the PRO will work better in that setting. So that leads to the distinction between inclusion criteria that might include objective measures of active inflammation to guarantee we're identifying the right patients, and endpoints that we're measuring regarding response to therapy or remission status. So if we were to fast forward or if you could just give us your insight into some of the uh, studies that are being designed right now and, and future clinical trials, what do you think it's going to look like? I mean, what should we expect? Well, I think then as you get into designing clinical trials, you want a couple of things to come out of your endpoints. So for sure you want a well-characterized patient population, and I think increasingly that's going to include endoscopy uh, and demonstrating active inflammation at endoscopy. But given, taking that as a given, then should you measure endoscopy, should you measure symptoms, or should you measure both? And the, the two kind of competing things uh, to consider as you make those choices, and of course this is a discussion between companies who develop drugs, investigators um, who give advice and recruit patients, patients who agree to be in the trials, which means serial imaging, and the regulators. So, you know, all of us have kind of a stake in the discussion. But the two tensions, on the one hand, you'd like an outcome measure that's very reproducible, 
that there's little variation between um, people who measure it uh, or report it if, if the patients are reporting symptoms. Um, so because any noise that you add into the measurement reduces the efficiency of the clinical trial. Right. And you need it to be responsive to change. Right. On the other hand, you need what you're measuring to have some clinical relevance. And so, you know, if you're going to measure endoscopy, you need to be convinced that it's relevant and that's really the, the disease and not a surrogate for the disease. Yes. And, and that's a, you know, a point of discussion. My hunch is we'll be doing more endoscopy endpoints and then eventually that that will become the gold standard and then, then we'll be looking for non-invasive biomarkers that accurately predict the endoscopy findings, but you know, time will tell. Are we at risk of setting the bar too high so that therapies that might otherwise be effective uh, or demonstrate a good response will fail in their clinical trials as we sort of muddle our way through some of this? Well, I think it's th that it's very important to look at that. Fortunately, there's a lot of investigators and groups and centers around the world that are paying attention to this. We're probably further along in ulcerative colitis, so we've come to realize we thought endoscopy was entirely objective, and then we came to realize that just because the endoscopist who's doing the procedure is blinded to the patient's therapy doesn't mean that there's not the potential for some bias to be introduced. Sure. And so increasingly now we're having uh, endoscopies videoed and having a central reader who knows nothing about the clinical scenario or the patient at all read the, the, the videos. And it looks like that improves the, reduces the noise or improves the efficiency of the endoscopy and by right. endpoint by about 30%. In Crohn's disease, you know, we need to sort of find that out. And if you think about the noise in a clinical measure, so if you're asking patients in 40 different languages, uh, you know, when we do these big international multi-country trials, uh, what their stool frequency is, well, what is a stool? Is it a rectal dry heave? Is it passing gas? Is it passing solid stool? Right. Is it passing liquid? Trying to translate that and get the same sort of ex response from patients of different educational backgrounds and sure. literacies and languages. You can imagine there's a lot of noise and an endoscopy might be cleaner. Yeah, well, it's, it can be complicated. Uh, you're absolutely right. So why don't we talk a little bit more about ulcerative colitis? So the ulcerative colitis index for a lot of our clinical trials um, more recently, at least, has been the Mayo, uh, the Mayo score, which is a composite index. Where, what's the history of the Mayo score, and where is that going? Well, in the mid-1990s, uh, there were several mesalamine products that uh, needed to be uh, developed. I'm sorry, in the mid-1980s, there were several uh, mesalamine products that needed to be developed, and there were not really good existing instruments. So some of my former colleagues at the, the Mayo Clinic, Bill Tremaine and Ken Schroeder, uh, developed uh, the Mayo instrument. It wasn't a formal validation process. It was two experienced and sensible clinicians sitting down and coming up with something. And at the same time, Lloyd Sutherland at the University of Calgary came up with the Sutherland Index. And if you lay these two next to each other, they're almost exactly the same. They're each uh, 0 to 12 scores with four domains. Uh, stool frequency, rectal bleeding, uh, the physician global assessment of severity, and sigmoidoscopy findings, and each of those range from zero to three. And there, you know, there's t slight differences between them, but they're 95 percent the same. Mm -hmm. And that's where they came from: as ex experienced clinicians uh, trying to, you know, write down what they knew. Has this held up better than the CDAI over time? I think that it has. Um, the, you know, ulcerative colitis, the, the clinical presentation is just a bit less variable. It's mm. really is stool frequency, rectal bleeding. These scores don't capture urgency very well, so that's a missing piece, but mm. it's proven not to be that critical. And then, you know, we've talked a bit about the endoscopy where that measure is just progressively right up through the present time tightening up. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, incontinence comes up as something that a patient would find to be a valuable endpoint as well, and that's not usually captured in these. Yeah, absolutely. Now, to what degree it overlaps with other findings? So, for instance, if you have ulcers at flexible sigmoidoscopy, would you pick up all the patients who have incontinence? Right. Uh, and, th and those are the things we don't absolutely. know. Absolutely. So, um, let's talk about what the clinician is doing in practice. So. I have yet to meet anyone who actually uses a CDAI in their clinical practice. Uh, more often, I have colleagues who are taking care of ulcerative colitis patients 
who can ad adopt similar approaches to the Mayo score uh, or the, the Sutherland index in their clinical practice from the standpoint of this is what their endoscopy showed and these are how their symptoms are currently um, uh, looking. But what, what is the current state of where clinicians are and what's missing? What do they need to know right now about how to manage their patients? Well, as you said, I think in ulcerative colitis, we're all used to taking a history which captures stool frequency, rectal bleeding. You have a global gestalt of how the patient's doing and whether they're remission, mild, moderate, or severe, whether you write it down or not. And when you scope the patients, it's pretty easy to apply the Mayo scoring system, which ranges from zero to three, with ulcers being a three, friability being a two, minor changes being a one, and normal being zero. Right. So I think you know, many of us kind of apply that in practice. In Crohn's, it's sort of abdominal pain, uh, stool frequency, how you doing, what are your labs, do you have any obstructive symptoms, any signs of complications, and then some of us will, uh, you know, do adjunctive imaging with colonoscopy and or an enterography with CT or MRI uh, along with that. That, that. You know, those imaging techniques are really sort of evolving in the management of patients. But um, I, I think that's what it is. And my prediction is that, that one advantage to moving towards the uh, patient reported outcome or PRO is that it's likely to be a heck of a lot simpler than the CDI. It will get at the essential things that the CDI had, but it might be just two items. Mm -hmm. um, something like you have more with irritable bowel syndrome to capture symptoms. And if we had a two item instrument, maybe we would do that in clinical practice. So my, my hunch is that what you're already doing in practice is gonna become codified as a PRO and it'll be easier to measure. It seems to me that for ulcerative colitis, clinicians are more comfortable because the, the symptoms the patient has uh, translate more directly into what they believe is going on and they can adjust therapy. And even when they decide they're going to look, which is important, they are very comfortable adjusting therapy based on what they see. In Crohn's, I haven't seen the same thing. Um, in other words, I find that clinicians will sort of manage patient's symptoms and allow them to um, go along before they make a decision for the next line of therapy, in part because they aren't necessarily comfortable with some of the laboratory markers of inflammation or other things. You once said when we were together uh, about whether people are going to actually make the move to adjust therapy based on these other findings in the absence of obvious symptoms, do you have the courage of your convictions? In other words, if you take a look uh, with an MRI and it shows active inflammation, will you adjust the therapy even if the patient doesn't have symptoms? And I thought that was really an important point because I think our clinician colleagues um, have been a little bit reluctant to make those decisions based only on imaging. So where are you with that right now and what do you think people need to be doing? I think this is really an important evolving concept. So what, what we learned in several trials, most recently the SONIC trial where we uh, took patients with moderate severe Crohn's disease, everybody got a CRP and a colonoscopy at baseline. We had some follow-up colonoscopy you know, later in the trial, and, and patients were randomized to different therapies. But everybody had to come in with moderate to severe symptoms, and what we found is that 20% of the patients who had a full and adequate colonoscopy, including ileal examination, had no evidence of active inflammation. Right. And then we went back, uh, and this paper is just recently in press and gut with uh, Laurent Pirin-Birolet, and we flipped, the, flipped it around and said, okay, if you define active Crohn's disease as the presence of ulcers at colonoscopy, what is the sensitivity and specificity of clinical measures, and in this case we used the CDAI, to uh, predict active Crohn's disease? And it was about 50% sensitive and specific. Yeah. And then we did the same thing against um, CRP, so, and found sort of the same thing. So what that means in practice is if you rely on symptoms to decide you're going to give a patient prednisone or azathioprine or biologic or combination Might therapy, well flip a coin. you're going to be right about half the time. You'll be over-treating patients, you'll be under-treating patients. Okay. And, and people are very often worried about the cost effectiveness of using the test. Mm -hmm. And what, what we tend to forget is how expensive biologic therapy is. And it's actually much more cost effective to image them than it is to just empirically use uh, biologic therapy. Well, let alone the downstream cost that in theory occurs when you're not managing the disease. Yeah, and the human cost. Right. So it, it begs a couple questions in my mind as we're going through this. The first is uh, we recognize the, the 
heterogeneity of Crohn's disease. Have we been making a big mistake by just lumping everyone with Crohn's into clinical trials together? Should we start teasing things apart even if it ends up making it harder to recruit into trials? Are we doing something wrong here? I'm not sure. Um, you know, the, the complexity of it is that uh, developing drugs requires a sufficient safety database that um, you can say something about the safety. And so if you make the treatment groups too small, you're going to have less therapies because it'll be so hard to recruit trials for those small groups to get, a, to get enough safety. So in some ways, what we need is an evolution in regulatory thought where we could take smaller, more homogeneous groups of patients and treat them for efficacy and then pool the safety data together across different groups of patients uh, so you're not proving safety in any one group and maybe you pull together the safety for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's mm -hmm. and you know use larger numbers of patients to prove safety and then focus efficacy evaluations on smaller discrete trials. One recent example of this, it's not yet approved but potentially coming up is the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 drug right. vetalizumab. So we were interested in whether these patients might get progressive multifocal loop encephalopathy or PML similar to what happened uh, with natalizumab. So to figure that out you needed 3,000 patients treated uh, with a median follow-up of at least 18 months and 1,000 patients. And to do that we had to mix two diseases together, colitis and Crohn's. And so if that drug gets approved, and I'm hopeful that it might uh, next year, uh, that's a good example of actually using two separate indications to populate the safety database. Yeah, that's the that's way, way to go, example. I think. So the other question that comes to mind is the better we get at recruiting patients who have true inflammation or who meet a phenotype that we're describing of a disease that's active, the lower the placebo response. So are we getting to a point where it's not ethical to, to uh, develop and perform placebo-controlled trials? In my opinion, no, because you have to think through what the alternative. So the alternative to a, a, and a placebo-controlled trials, you're not going to do any equivalence against placebo because that doesn't make any clinical sense. So those are always superiority trials. Mm -hmm. If you go against a known active, um, you know, you're going to be subtracting the efficacy of the known active out of the equation, mm -hmm. which means you're probably going for a smaller uh, difference or a smaller delta, and you'll need vastly larger trials, which may not be feasible. Uh, if you go for equivalence or non-inferiority, um, from a regulatory standpoint, the regulators are often looking for you to exclude with 95% difference or 95% certainty that the difference between the two therapies doesn't exceed about three or four or five percent, mm -hmm. which means the actual difference needs to be about zero percent or one percent difference, or the new therapy needs to trend being better. Right. And those, so for instance, a non-inferiority or equivalence trial could be 1,600 patients. Yeah. So if we set the bar like that, we will have many fewer drugs and at a population level, you know, we'll be harming patients by having fewer drugs, I think. I, I agree with that. So it has to do a little bit with um, the greatest good for the greatest number, but also smart clinical trial design. I mean, um, the more recent clinical trials have offered open label extensions and uh, allowing patients to cross over, and there's a variety of ways that I think we can address this that it still makes sense. But the better we get at lowering placebo response, the more efficient the trial will be anyway, and hopefully that will lead to some better approaches. Now, the other thing you could ask, so for instance, are we at the point where um, it doesn't make sense to do a placebo-controlled trial of mesalamine for ulcerative colitis? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. Mm -hmm. It's clearly effective and it's clearly safe. Right. By contrast, azathioprine and mercaptopurine are off-label. They have lots of safety issues and to require that you do a comparative study against an unapproved drug with a bumpy safety record doesn't make too much sense. The anti-TNF drugs are expensive. Not all patients have access to them. They can have enormous copays in the U.S. environment. Yes. They have a lot of safety issues. So again, to require that patients you know, have those drugs, which are approved, but they're imperfect comparators as the comparator is, um, in my view, you know, probably wrong-headed. 
But as we get to the point where you have, for various indications, the, the equivalent of mesalamine and ulcerative colitis, then I think we really do have to think about the ethics of a placebo-controlled trial when you get just the right drug for the right indication. So let's spend our remaining time now just talking about clinical practice. So given what we've learned about um, our therapies, the trials that have been completed recently, our ability to actually achieve both um, steroid-free remission and mucosal healing or mucosal or endoscopic improvement, however you want to word it, what should the clinician be thinking when they're treating a patient with, let's start with Crohn's, then we'll talk about ulcerative colitis. What's the take home message today? When I go back to clinic tomorrow, how should I be thinking about managing my patient from a goal point of view and an endpoint point of view? So you're gonna hear a number of words uh, and phrases coming out in the next year or two. One is the concept of deep remission, meaning that you're achieving biologic healing. And right now, the endpoint that we often use is endoscopy. In the future, it might be MRI or biomarkers. And clinical remission, or if some patients with long-standing disease and multiple operations, maybe you can never get rid of their symptoms, but you treat them to bowel healing. Uh, and as long as there's residual inflammation and symptoms, you sort of keep escalating therapy. Then there's the concept of treat to target. Well, treat to target is how you get to deep remission. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea that you have a kind of evidence-based algorithm of various therapies that you would move through, but you keep moving through not only to clinical symptoms as we did in the early days, like we've been discussing, but to deep remission where you're getting the patients into you know, endoscopic remission as well as uh, control of their clinical symptoms. And then mod disease modification or modifying the natural history of the disease and ultimately preventing disability. So the idea is to treat early with highly effective treatment regimens using a treat to target strategy to achieve deep remission with the goal of preventing bowel damage and disability. So that's the concept that you kind of have to get in your mind. Right. But what it really means in practice is don't guess when you're making a major treatment decision, figure out what's the right imaging test for that patient, make sure that their symptoms are really corroborated by uh, a reasonable amount of objective evidence of inflammation, and then start to consider, given the disconnect between symptoms and objective measures, whether you might also do some follow-up um, imaging study, colonoscopy, MRI, something you know, four to six months out after changing therapy to make sure that you're moving towards deep remission and not just symptom control. So it's a cycle of adjustment of therapy at sort of prescribed intervals based on available evidence to achieve your goal. Um, I mean, think back to your internal medicine roots with uh, diabetes. You're, sure. you're treating to the target uh, of blood sugar in the, um, in the immediate term, a glycosylated hemoglobin in the intermediate term, and then in the long term, you're trying to prevent the complications of diabetes. So this is starting right. to move in that concept. And that's the analogy I've often used when I've described this both to patients and to our colleagues. So I guess there are some missing pieces in all this, but it, some of this is coming together and we can already understand a little bit how we might work through this. I have found that patients are very interested in this. They like the idea of interval assessments and knowing whether their therapy is working. I found that to be a helpful way to discuss risk when you tell a patient that you're going to use the therapy and after you've gone through some of the risks of the therapy, I often will remind them, by the way, if this isn't working, we're going to know by checking at some point together and we'll do something else to make it work better or to switch our therapies. And they actually are interested in that because I think that the mindset has been we're going to use one therapy and keep trying it for some undefined amount of time until something else happens to you and then make a change, or you're gonna just be on this forever, which is never the way to think about it these days. So the other part of all this then I guess would be understanding a little bit more about what do you do when you haven't hit your target. I mean, where are we with that? Is dose adjustment reasonable and is there evidence to support that? Um, when do you say that this is as far as I'm gonna go and I won't look anymore? I mean, do we have any of those things worked out yet? I think it's still early days, and you have a responsibility to, you know, use common sense and good judgment as you go along, and, and especially in this kind of transitional period that we're in. So, you know, if I have a patient with ulcerative colitis and, you know, there's some uh, granularity and some pseudopolyps uh, and just maybe the slightest hint of friability here or there, 
So it's a, on a zero to three scoring system, it's about a you know, 0.5, uh, maybe a one, 1 1.2, something like that. Am I, am I gonna escalate on that? Not necessarily if the patient feels well and they're steroid free. On the other hand, if there's a good bit of friability, even if the patient's feeling well, many of those patients are gonna have trouble in the coming months, and I'd be very comfortable uh, escalating therapy, changing classes from mesalamine to immune suppressives or biologics or both, escalating a biologic dose. In Crohn's disease, kind of the same thing. If you see you know, four or five aptus ulcers, are you gonna you know, declare nuclear war on that? I don't think so, I wouldn't. On the other hand, if you see you know, several deep ulcers, uh, even an asymptomatic patient, I think that we believe those lesions probably have a poor prognosis, and you'll take the larger history into account. How old is the patient? Have they had operations? Where exactly is the anatomy uh, that, where these lesions are located? Yes. So all of those kind of soft things. But um, in, in my mind, there are lots of endoscopic findings that I'd pre be prepared to make major changes in therapy on in the absence of symptoms. So it's clear in this discussion today that uh, the field of inflammatory bowel disease has evolved not only in the available therapies we have for our patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but also in the design of clinical trials where we've gotten smarter and been able to look at better endpoints and used, I think, evolving indices. But also, this has translated into clinical practice to the point where we've been able now to say, not only are we going to put out the fire, but we're going to do a better job making sure it stays out and hopefully changing outcomes. So I'm looking forward to what's coming. I know there's a lot of new things on the way, but I would say that even right now, our clinician colleagues and our patients have a lot to be very optimistic about and that they can actually embrace today to actually change the history of those diseases. I, I fully agree. Between new therapeutic options and treatment strategies and a new way of thinking about approaching it, a lot of good can be done today. Well, thank you very much for discussing this today. Thank you, my pleasure.